Welcome, Petteri Kolinen. Nice to have you here. Super great. How? Hi, Markus. Thanks for the invitation. It's great to be here. Yeah, Petteri Kolinen is an expert in design and brand, and he's the CEO of Design Forum Finland, which is a non-profit organization boosting design in, in companies. So tell me, Petter, a little bit about your backstory. <laughs> okay, thanks, Markus. Um, so my background is heavily in design. I'm an industrial designer from my background, from my basic education. Okay. And uh, I also studied a few years in uh, design leadership uh, program in the early 90s in the uh, University of Industrial Arts here in Finland. Uh, in 93, I joined uh, Nokia, Nokia Mobile Phones, which was a uh, merging company it was still still a sort of challenger in the in the mobile phone markets with something like 10 12 percent market share but it was okay. uh, it was to pick up motorola and ericsson which were the big giants which were leading the market yeah uh, in nokia i designed mobile phones and then i was in charge of different kind of design design teams mm -hmm. and multimedia and i was also leading the uh, design studio in the nokia headquarters for a few years okay uh, by uh, 2007, uh, I think I had seen quite a bit of the mobile phone industry, so I was recruited, uh, headhunted to, to uh, Martella Group as a design director, where I was in charge of the, uh, let's say, most bits and pieces which are related with, with brand building, group marketing, uh, R&D, uh, product okay. management, things like that. And what business is Martella? Tell, tell people. Martel is in uh, actually in uh, office furniture uh, space, okay. uh, public space design. Business, but that's that. All right. Yeah. And the aim there was actually to to sort of uh, raise the company from uh, from very stagnated situation in the Finnish market to become more international and, and uh, interesting. Okay. Uh, so that was the that was the core idea. Became uh, let's say leading in international player instead of being a very local uh, domestic uh, market leader. Yeah, so, so Petteri, and, and then you went to Nanso and now you are here, yeah. Exactly, yeah. In Nanso it was pretty much about the same idea. I think it's a, Nanso is a fashion company with, with multiple uh, brands and they are very, very sort of have a big and uh, big role in the Finnish market, at least they used to have an uh, almost 100 years history. But I think it's a really excellent example of a company which is, has been uh, suffering from this, uh, this uh, let's say, uh, structural change in the market. So yeah. as the market became, became global and, uh, and the consumer started to, started to uh, sort of purchase through different kind of web, web uh, shops, uh, I think uh, the company lost their competitiveness quite quickly. So the idea was to, was yeah. to sort of uh, revitalize the brand and, and the collection. Yeah. Okay, and now you have probably been working with very many small and medium-sized enterprises also. So, and you, so you have a lot of experience in differentiating companies, finding the reason why they would be different. And I know, Petteri, that you talk about the soul of the company. I remember you mentioned that to me. Exactly. I think it's a really important thing to have a clear identity. I think as the... Uh, as all the branches are getting more more sort of global and the competitive competitive environment is much more uh, let's say fragmented i mm -hmm. think it's really crucial to have a clear identity for the company and that's the uh, let's say the basic uh, and the base that's the heart and soul of the company so i think it has to be you have to sit down for a while and think about your identity what are the core values how do you operate and, and how does it start to cascade in different parts of the company so, uh, Petteri, how, what is the difference between uh, a company's purpose and the company's identity? How would you define that? I think purpose is, uh, is a part of the identity. I think it's, a, it's quite often, is a, is a, let's say, a statement or a, or a sort of a written uh, uh, description of the purpose of the company. But identity is even more. It's about how the company feels and tastes and looks like. It's also, it's a little bit like, like a person. You have, yeah. identity, I have identity and it's, uh, it's uh, other things as well as only the values or the purpose of, of you, or you and me. So I think it's, a, it's a, in a way more um, holistic thing. Yeah, okay, yeah. 
yeah, nice. And um, and now, uh, um, how do you how do you do? I mean, when you meet the company now, and then uh, then uh, then uh, your task is to help them to find the identity to be different. Can you tell a little bit about the process? How how do you do such things? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you have to just sit down and, and uh, have a very thorough and uh, and holistic discussion with with uh, as big portion of the of the sort of uh, staff of a company as possible. So I think it's really, in a way, the identity already lives in the company. You just have to dig it out and crystallize it. So I think it's okay. uh, quite often you use do different kind of workshops with the with the company with the people inside the company to really think what are the crucial and important values that we have and how, how, how does it sort of uh, reflect on the, on the everyday life and everyday business. So I think it's usually start from having discussions and workshop with the, with the, with the broad audience, then you start to crystallize it. To crystallize it, yeah. Crystallize. And now, now you know this idea that, uh, that uh, Stradigo is promoting this strategy one page or so. So uh, what is the connection now between the identity and the strategy, and still, still like to squeeze you or to clarify that. <laughs> I think uh, identity is the like, like the heart and soul of the company, and then you have the vision where you want to be in in few years time, and then in between uh, the, the vision, you have the strategy, which is the plan how to get to the vision more or less. So I think it's a. Uh, it's re really tightly connected with the identity, so it has to be, be uh, completely synchronized with the identity, and it has to, has to in a way, uh, make the identity uh, flesh and blood. It has to be become reality, and the strategy helps in, in that. But I think it's a uh, uh, really crucial to have very clear and sharp strategy. So I think the one page approach is excellent in that sense that you really crystallize the core of the strategy in an in understandable and, and sharp way. Petteri, pidetään tauko, mä panin. Kuulet sä noita plingejä, kun tulee mulle? Jotain tulee, joo, mutta aika Sä kyllä se on toi WhatsApp, ja nyt sieltä on liikennettä, ja nyt, nyt tää on paus... Hetkinen. Okei. Okay. Menikö se pauselle nyt? Pa paus... Joo. Uh, Petteri, you have met several small and medium-sized companies. What, what do they bring to the table? What is the challenge that they have when they meet you? I think in most cases the, uh, the main challenge is the, let's say, the uh, fragmentation of the company. So you, you don't have a holistic uh, identity, holistic plan for the company, holistic, uh, let's say, uh, purpose for the company. It's quite often there are, it's very, uh, especially companies which have been uh, existing for a long time, they have been uh, they have been sort of uh, managed to learn a very practical way of dealing with issues. But I think in the global global competition, it's it's crucial that you are standing out from the competitors. You have to differentiate, and that's a uh, I think is is in most cases the biggest challenge. That uh, they have been they might have been operating quite locally on a domestic market, and uh, they they have very. Uh, very familiar customers and, and, and so on, and also familiar competitors. But now when the competition and the, uh, let's say, customer base is more global, it's really, really crucial to be different and stand, stand out from the competitors and be unique in that sense. So if you, if you meet a company like this now, so, so how long is a typical meeting? And can you help them in one hour, two hours meeting, or, or do they need a, 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 a a series of workshops to find out this. Quite a bit. Uh, you can you can sort of on, on a general level you can find out the main challenges in, in few hours discussions. I think okay. in, in a way that's the good starting point. Also, uh, but maybe to convince top management in few hours that's quite challenging in many cases. You have to present different kind of cases and, and scenarios and and so on. But. Uh, but quite often you can spot the uh, challenges in the company in a few hours discussion. So okay. and I, I would say that you ask about the SMEs. I think it's uh, the uh, challenges are very uh, similar in different companies and also in different branches. It's not very, very much a branch related thing. So it's pretty oh. generic approach to, to, to the way the company is. That's interesting. That's really interesting. So, so, so you already mentioned the fragmentation. 
But think of a startup, let's say that they have, they, in, in the beginning when they are very much a startup, then, then they have so much ideas and they want to do, they probably don't have, have this problem in the beginning, they don't think. But let's say after a few years, then they have grown to five or 10 persons. Let's take the 10 person company. Oh, so, so have you met those? What kind of challenges do they have? I'm, I'm also have been uh, advising a few startups at the moment. I think I'm advising four different startups at the moment. And I think uh, the benefit is that they don't have the long history and the little bit uh, stagnating uh, culture, which is quite often slow, slowing down the change in very traditional SMEs. The startups are starting from fresh starting point and they are sort of uh, speeding and, and uh, accelerating to the, to the desired direction. But I think the challenge often, often is that uh, also the guys who are starting, or, or ladies who are starting startups, they are also uh, forming a different type of silo. They are quite often quite uh, coming, guys who are coming from quite similar kind of backgrounds. But I think this multidisciplinary approach is, is quite often missing in the startups. It's a multidisciplinary approach, open up that a little bit. What do you mean? Uh, I would say that you, you should introduce the designers, uh, sort of uh, uh, guys from the business school and the engineers, so that you have this multidisciplinary team. Okay. But yeah. Quite no. often you might have guys from uh, sort of coders or, or uh, engineers only in startups. So it, it, quite often they are quite quite they have formed their own silo, even though it's pretty agile, but it's still a silo. So I think that's that's very common common challenge. Okay, that, that's, that's very, very interesting. But these startups that you are talking about, how old are they? One year, two year, three year, five year, how, how old are they? There are different kind of startups that I've been working. I would just, we just purchased uh, acoustic phone booth here in, in our office. And that's a company I, the guys, they were actually studying from in the university at, uh, eight years ago. There were two guys from the technical university and their, their phone booth looked horrible. They didn't have any brand and then we did some work together and they had some also other things and now the company is uh, listed on the financial time uh, times uh, fastest growing european companies it's number 20. so the the growing rate has been uh, three thousand during the past three years and it's a uh, well, that's uh, three thousand percentage yeah 60, 60 million company with two two hundred people employees but it's a uh, and then we have been, I've been working with companies which have not been succeeding, but that there are the other reasons as well. But uh, I think there have been different kind of companies in, in different phases. But I think this framework, which I was referring to, it's, it has been extremely successful. But it was a company with, this was clearly a startup. It has two guys with the idea about phone booth, but nothing else. Phone booth, well, open up that, I don't understand that. <laughs> what is that? <laughs> It's uh, actually it's a uh, it's a tackling a very uh, very let's say real problem in in open space offices. It's a place where you can have. Ah, now I understand. So you have some kind of okay. You have a, some kind of small room where you don't disturb people. Yeah. Exactly, and that's a company which has ninety percent is going going to export, and it's okay. extremely uh, profitable and it's growing growing like uh, like uh, mushrooms. Yeah. Well, then when you come up to to let's say when the uh, when the founder CEO has 10 people, then he, he, they can't sit around the same coffee table every day any, anymore. And then they grow to 25. And what I learn is that very, very often when you come to that point, the founder CEO realizes that, hey, I just can't do this anymore. I can't be everywhere, you know, joining the decision making and the steering. And, and then f finally at that stage, in my experience, you need to write something down that would be our policy, how to align the company. Do yeah, you have so these cases in your portfolio? <laughs> yeah, definitely. And I think as I was talking about this identity earlier, I think that's the thing that you should uh, somehow nail down in the, in the really early phases. That's actually should be the, uh, the sort of uh, core uh, basis for leading the company. It should, uh, should uh, help the decisions in marketing and, and R&D and, and product uh, portfolio creating or service portfolio creation and so on. If okay, but better. Hey, give me an example of an identity that you come okay. to think of. So, so how does an what is an identity? <laughs> <laughs> I can give you a, a, a sort of example. 
I guess you know uh, Kura Distillery Company. Yes, yeah. yes, I okay. happen to know that one. Yeah, distillery. Yeah. Yeah. That's a that's a company which started from the identity. There were five guys sitting in sauna and thinking what kind of uh, a company they could create in the middle of the let's say uh, nowhere. <laughs> middle of nowhere in Österbot. And they were sitting in sauna thinking that we have plenty of uh, really clean rye. Uh, and, and different kind of uh, sort of uh, clean and fresh raw materials in this area. And they yeah. see, decided their core values. And they also decided that they also uh, sort of uh, work with the company, which also visually and uh, sort of uh, verbally put it together their identity. And that has been the leading, leading uh, sort of uh, approach on what kind of uh, so the manufacturing facilities they have been creating, what kind of marketing concept they have been creating, what kind of packaging, what kind of designing the products, uh, what kind of approach. Yeah. The leading document for everything that they have been doing since that. And it has also been very successful. And, and the main product is? Uh, actually, they were planning to do whiskey, but uh, because it took so long time to mature, they, they made gin in between. So it's a, it's a Finnish made gin. And it's very, very successful, very popular. It's growing. I, I can't remember the figures, but it's. Uh, it's and they won awards because I happen to have uh, that gene in my, <laughs> in my bar. You know. That's a typical company which started from the identity. They were really sitting down about the value. What kind of things are we, uh, sort of. Uh, Embrace. The funny thing is that that they are real. They taste different. The the gin tastes different than ordinary gins. That exactly. they be able also in the taste to differentiate. Yeah, yeah, that's true. And also when you have the really interesting brand, the alcohol start to start to taste differently. It's also mentally. <laughs> it's mentally also. Okay. So hey, Petteri, now let's talk about uh, strategy. And, and, uh, and a bit, which is the thing that comes out from the identity. So uh, how do you see, what is the meaning of a strategy for a 10 to 25 per, per person company? Do they need one? That's the first question. I think definitely. I'm a really big believer in, in, uh, in strategy. Uh, I think strategy is the, is the plan how you become successful. You might have a vision two years ahead and then you just create uh, steps like in, in ladders. What kind of steps are you going to take? What is the main primi primary things that you do in the first year and then go further with, with the, let's say the secondary and so on. So I think it's a, yeah. it's, it gives direction for the organization, direction for your company. It's also a really important thing for, for prioritizing different things and, and uh, it's also a crucial thing for leadership too. So but there you said it, there you gave the whole, whole list. But hey, now a difficult one. You know, Petri, many people, me included, believed still a few years ago that strategy is that you go straight to that direction. But now I have been realizing, hey, a linear strategy is dead. Hmm. That it doesn't just work because if you make a linear plan tomorrow, it's already something happened and it's old and you have to adjust. So now I more believe in the se sector type of strategy and inside that, you move like agile. Do you have a, how do you comment this? Hmm. I think I, I've been discussing about this quite a bit with different companies and with different people, but uh, uh, I think the challenge with the constant change is that the culture and the people are the, are the, are the ones who create the uh, inertia for, for change. The, it, it, that's the, what's slowing it down. It takes a while for people to adopt different things and to understand different things. So I think we, even though the strategy can be agile, and of course you have to react every year in the uh, changing yeah. environment, I think you have to take in account that uh, the mental uh, thinking, the thinking with the people changes slowly. And the longer history you have, the stronger culture you have, the longer it takes to change. So usually the culture is the is the uh, break for creating really fast moves. But, but now you now you took up Peter, a, a really important challenge, and and, and is this in uh, in internal inertia of, of our human minds 
but uh, but then we all know that that uh, it's hard to compete with an old solution, <laughs> even though it's in the walls, as so, you know, culture and so on. So, how in the hell are they going to solve that one? <laughs> the slowness, you mean? Yeah, the slowness because we need the agility. Exactly. And still, we are. Uh, hmm. I think it's a. Uh, you have to have the big picture, right? You have to have the vision and the direction, and you have to somehow stick with that but in between the short-term goals i think there can be more agile uh, we have been creating uh, the company where i'm working at the moment we just created the vision four or five years ago four years ago and it was quite a radical change for this uh, this way that we have been operating before and i realized that it took two or three years before the people inside the company started to really understand the value and and started to contribute. So if I would have been chasing the direction all the time, I think it could have been really, really uh, chaotic for the leadership. Well, very true. Hey, uh, what do you think, pe people? There are now many persons that start to believe that you should have an evolving purpose and not more a vision. You know that uh, that. Uh, so I has also said that uh, purpose equals mission plus vision. It's the same thing, the, the, the purpose is there today and then it will evolve to something bigger, which in a way is the vision. But how do you think about this? If, uh, does it rock in your mind? Or <laughs> yeah, it does. Yeah, I think it's a, uh, it takes a while before the purpose uh, starts to be uh, deeds, so things that you have, yeah. been, have done. So that's, that's why, it, uh, why it's a, uh, the purpose itself is actually more or less nothing. Of course, it gives you direction, but deeds, the things that you have been doing, how do you cascade it down from, from only the, the sort of uh, crystallizing the purpose? I think that's the crucial thing. Yeah. That's also, also dealing with strategy. It's e equally, actually, it's more important to how do you implement the strategy than to create the strategy. And that's also a common problem, I think, is that you create really put really important things in strategy, but the implementation is, is not done. It is implementation sucks, yeah. <laughs> so, now tell me about what kind of pitfalls and traps have you experienced in the, in the in, let's say, implementation? Uh, lack of implementation. <laughs> I think it's, a, it's very common, common that, uh, that there are, it's like, uh, it's like wishes that you put in your strategy, but you are not really clear, cre uh, creating uh, annual plans. How do you implement it? So I think it's a, it's a, I, I'm just working in a, in a advisory board of a, of a really big uh, Finnish uh, insurance company. And they have some goals in the vision, in their strategy. But I don't see any really, really clear pro projects that are leading to that uh, goal. So I think it's a, mm -hmm. It seems like you put some kind of wishes in the strategy, but you are not really creating a roadmap. Yeah, yeah. yeah you need a roadmap and, and you need a follow-up mechanism. You need meetings where you look at the roadmap. Are, are we proceeding here or, or not? Exactly. I think it's, and I think it's so interesting to understand. But some people are able to do that, and those are the benchmarks. And, and now we, so, so what is the, Petteri, the best benchmark in your world? about implementing strategies have you what kind of company you don't have to say the name but but um, what do they do i think uh, i was talking about this culture and this uh, very stagnated uh, corporate culture so i think co companies which are able to understand the uh, changing environment in the, in the global uh, uh, competition and they are really able to react on that on a short term i think those are the most impressive ones yeah. Those who are able to, first of all, create a new strategy, new vision, where they're aiming, and then are able to change the uh, corporate culture so that you are really reacting fast and going to new right direction uh, fast. I think th those are the ones which I, quite often it's about uh, acquisitions or, or changes in the generations, in the, in the leadership that create this kind of uh, opportunity windows. Yeah. Uh, but I would hope that there would be more companies that uh, don't need this kind of uh, fundamental changes uh, and they still could be agilely reacting on the, on the change of the global market. Yeah, 
Yeah, it's funny that some people say that, you know, who, who are the most conservative people in, inside the company? You know who those are, Peter? Have you heard this? It's of course sales. And you know why sales is the most conservative? Because they talk with customers who, who are even more conservative. But now we haven't been talking, uh, this is a joke, but now we have been uh, talking about uh, uh, internal things, identity, culture, and so on. So how about the customers? Mm -hmm. So how could we, how could we, so to say, how could we support and help the customers better? What, what does that require? Okay, I also have on this one a little bit unorthodox approach. So grab your chair. So <laughs> unorthodox. Okay, I we love that one. Let's come shoot, Peter. <laughs> well, I was, I, I still a little bit uh, a short story about this. When I was working for Nokia, we had. Uh, in the early years when we were challenged with the big competitors. We had a uh, different kind of consumer studies. We created concepts and then we were testing with the, the front runners, the early adopters of the customers. Yeah. And that was extremely successful. So we recruited a group of people who were able to understand the future of the business. Where is it going? And we, in a way, in a way visualize it with the different kind of concepts. And okay. the, let's say the successful era of Nokia when it became the undisputed number one and so on. Later on, I think the decision making was more internal and the, the, it was based on the, on the very strong input from the sales and business units. And quite often the problem is that then you're looking a little bit the back, back mirror because you see what's on the market at the moment, but you don't see the, uh, let's say the future need because that's a, there's a lot of quotes about this. Uh, for example, Steve Jobs has a one quote. He says that uh, that if you do what the customers ask, and once you get it done, they want something else. So it's quite often it's so that uh, if the creation of the product or the service takes a while, year or two, whatever it takes, the situation in the market is completely different. And this is the, I would say that the fundamental problem with the, when we talk about um, uh, the uh, sort of customer-driven approach that you would understand the yeah. future customer need and that's a then you're much more competitive instead of creating something that hey, have nice nice slogan Peter. you have, have to understand the future customer need exactly and that's, that's the current difficult. customer need exactly and that's the difficult thing because you have a lot of opinions what's on the market what you see around your your sort of marketplace and that's quite often it's a little bit disturbing because the trends are changing, there might be new technology, whatever, which is changing the, the yeah. playground. And then it's quite difficult to see the future customer trend, but it's uh, less riskier than do something that the com com uh, competitors have already done. Which is <laughs> but you have to talk with the forefront people. That's, that is your message, I understood. Exactly. And you have to somehow, from our, our point of view, designers have to crystallize it and create proposals. And uh, it has to be quite tangible. If you, you uh, by discussing, it's very difficult for the for the people to say anything. But when you start to put some concepts on the table or having something uh, tangible to discuss with, then it's much easier to discuss with them. Okay, very good advice. So, Petteri, hey, what a package! I'm I'm quite overwhelmed already with with ideas that you you're telling. But but hey, what we would be now your advice to our virtual summit viewers? Many are in the situation that they need now to, they are in the growth phase where they need to do something differently in order to create the growth and, and maybe they need to change their internal structure because they have grown and they have these growth pains. So what is your main advice to these people now? Hmm. Uh, I always talk about this identity thing. I think it's really important to have the same values, the same uh, core thinking inside the company. If you don't have that, it's, it's, it's going to make the uh, doing very fragmented. And it's also cost efficient that you have the common ground for values and, and way of working and things like that. Yeah, and identity was that you have the values. Is it some kind of adjectives, what kind of person you are or what is it? In a way, but you can create mood boards about your whistle word and you can write down about your values, what is the uh, yeah. open them and make them uh, sort of that they are real and they are genuine. Quite often companies also have the problems that they create values which are actually just created. They are not based on the 
actually on the history and, and the life of the company. So yeah, so you can't do that because then the gap is too big. Exactly, and they have to be genuine and real because everything uh, false is coming through. Uh, everything is so transparent yeah. nowadays, so you have to be and, real. And that, and that means that that you have to take your the whole staff there somehow to to that that they are real because otherwise. I mean, I have a joke, by the way, I must tell you that often when I go to, to, to the companies, especially bigger companies, and I see their values, so, so, and they have these four values typically, you know, there, and then I, I inside my mind, this is a little bit exaggeration, I know, but I say, okay, exactly the, the opposite is true. <laughs> because that's why they are shooting out. So it's a slider, you know, this is very true, or we are not working out, and, and they take the values, in the slider in the middle, they are a little bit working, but they are not working enough, and that's why they communicate. So, so it's a nice joke, you know, the opposite is true. If you say that we are very customer oriented, we are very, very profit oriented, then nobody is customer oriented and nobody is making any profit. So, so that's a funny thing. In a little bit, it's, that, that's actually what I was saying about this that you put in your values and strategy, but this shy wishes that what you would like to be, values. but you're, so. you're not actually implementing those. Values is the same thing. When you put your values on the table and you're committed, you really have to start to work according to those things. It can yeah. be a gap between the values and what you're doing or how and, you operate. And there are these people who belong to that school that they say that, that uh, always these problems is a problem of leadership. Mm. So, so it's always a managerial leadership problem when you have this. So it's, of course, it starts from you who are the founder and CEO and leading that. And it's, it's your person. Is this true, by the way, that identity is very close to the, to the uh, number one guy identity? Or is it not true? I think it's true. I think without the clear identity, it's really difficult to lead a company because then you start to but company. is it tied to the, to the CEO very much, that identity? Uh, there was a study about this. I think in some countries the CEO is behind the identity, like in most cases. But uh, of course, he or she has to stand out from the values but, uh, uh, for the identity. But I think then you start to work with the marketing director and, and whatever. So it, it has to cast it down from there. Hey, Petteri. I think I think you are marvelous in articulating these things, and, and that's you know you know we have been talking very much you and uh, I uh, about this, and Peter is so much a for, forefront guy, and, and understanding that, and you are very skilled also in, in articulating, which is a skill by the way, that you are able to say your message in a in Can a. Can I say one, one short comment on that? Were you asking about this last message? I think one also really important thing is to think about the long-term value which is quite often dealing with the let's say the brand value the desirability of the brand the desirability yeah. of the products services which quite often gives you more turnover more uh, better margin and things like that because quite often you only measure the short-term uh, things short-term value like uh, margin uh, turnover and so on but i think it's really really important to also keep long-term Value, creating the long-term value and not yeah creating. it's a balance it's, it's a, balance. a balance you have to have both and if you don't have both you will be in trouble tomorrow yeah exactly yeah hey Petteri, great thank you we could go on for two hours more but but exactly. the, that's the next step thank you very much Petteri, and, and good luck and much energy for your big mission that you have in in your pro professional life thank you and, and see thank you, you. and it was a pleasure thanks a lot thank you, thank thanks. you. Bye. Bye.